What's up? What's up? This is Zach Boschman checking in. You are locked into the Citizen Truth Podcast. We are honored today to be joined by prolific writer, Dr. Ramsey Baroud. Now, Dr. Ramsey, um, I want to focus in specifically today on one of your books, The Last Earth, A Palestinian Story. I'd like to focus in specifically on the first chapter. You tell the story of a young man, Khaled Abdul Ghani, I believe it is. And, um, you know, for the people who don't know, who is he? You know, when was Khaled born? Where was he born? Just give us uh, the basics of, of who Khaled is, if you don't mind. Well, Khaled Abdul Ghani Al-Lubani was born in, um, in the Yarmouk refugee camp. Uh, but... Um, He's a Palestinian, of course, and he's a Palestinian refugee. But what he did not realize is that the story of, of that of the refugee, the story of the Palestinian diaspora that was meant to end with him, never truly ended. To the contrary, he realized that many years after his grandfather was ethnically cleansed along with his village, from Northern Palestine in 1948. And then later on, his own father was expelled as well. And they finally found themselves on the outskirts of the refugee camp of Yarmouk that with time grew to become a city of its own hosting the descendants of Palestinian refugees and tens of thousands of working class Syrians that one day he would too become a refugee and he would be seeking salvation somewhere else. So the story of Khaled, uh, also known as Marco to his friends and peers, it was is really more or less the story of his grandfather and the story of his father, that of what we call in Arabic, the Shatat, meaning the diaspora. And now he is still on that same path that was taken by his grandfather uh, uh, 70 years or so ago. So let's go back in time a bit. Uh, you talk about um, Marco's grandfather. Um, where was he born in Palestine? And, uh, you know, what did he do in Palestine? And uh, tell us, you know, uh, why he had to leave. Right. So, of course, it's important for our listeners to understand that the story of, of Khaled and the story of, of, uh, of his father and grandfather is essentially the story of millions of Palestinians. So the book, The Last Earth, selected these characters whose stories are more or less representative of the overall Palestinian uh, suffering and exile. Um, so it all kind of most of the Palestinian tragedies of today can all be linked back to a specific date and, and, and time that is uh, of the mid-1948. That's when the ethnic cleansing of nearly 500 Palestinian villages by the new state of Israel became, was completed. And Israel was established in that very month of May on the ruins of that historic Palestine. One of these 500 villages is called Alimjadil. Alimjadil is a village that is located somewhere in the northern Palestine near uh, the, the city of Akko. Um, he was the entire population of Alimjadil, along with Khaled's uh, grandfather, uh, were uh, uh, kicked out of the country. And the decision of where to escape was really kind of related to geography more than anything else. I was born and raised in a refugee camp myself in the Gaza Strip. The decision of my grandfather to escape to the Gaza Strip had a lot to do with the fact that his village was located in Southern Palestine. Therefore, the safest place to escape to was Gaza. Hundreds of thousands of refugees were expelled outside of Palestine altogether, and others were dislocated within Palestine itself, living in refugee camps. Khaled's father was pushed out of Al-Mjadil, and he ended up in, in Lebanon and in Syria. Uh, in Syria, they lived in a, a, a small village called Jobar, uh, 
uh, and Jobar eventually, they moved from Jobar all the way to Yarmouk, where other Palestinians gathered, and they felt a greater sense of safety and security with these tens of thousands of Palestinians who lived in that place that eventually uh, uh, was made an official refugee camp. It's called Yarmouk because of the Yarmouk River that runs through that area. Now, the idea here was that Muhammad Abdul Ghani and Nubani, Khaled's grandfather, was supposed to go back to Palestine. That was the idea. And that was the idea that my grandfather had as well, that we are in these refugee camps temporarily. In fact, they were called temporary shelters. Uh, that were designated by the United Nations as such at the time. And we will eventually go back. In fact, many of them, including my grandfather, refused to take, for example, the, the clean and new blankets because they did not, did not want them to be uh, uh, destroyed in the dust and, and of the journey because they were sure that they were coming back. Well, 70 years later, they never came back. Uh, Abdul, uh, Muhammad uh, Abdul Ghani al Lubani had a family, had kids, their kids had kids. They were all born with that same refugee status, living in this kind of transition that seemed to be endless and perpetual. And just when Khaled was convinced that going to Palestine was a matter of time, he ended up heading somewhere entirely different leaving Yarmouk during the civil war all the way to northern Syria, then to Turkey, then to Greece, and so on, starting a whole new diaspora and a whole new exile, this time not in Palestine or even the Middle East, but in Europe. So let's go into um, Halid's story, Halid or Marco's uh, story, um, when he was forced to, to leave Syria during the civil war. Um, actually, before we get into what leaving looked like, I I'm wondering if we could speak a little bit to what Halid's life looked like during the civil war when it initially broke out in Yarmouk. That's right. Um, an important point here, Zach, is that my chapter or the chapter we wrote about uh, Khaled or Marco was the culmination of many interviews we have conducted with the people of, of uh, Yarmouk, Palestinian refugees. Some of them, we spoke to them while they were still in Yarmouk during the height of the civil war. Others, we spoke to them uh, in their journey and some spoke to them when they arrived in Europe. Um, Khaled in particular, we kind of accompanied him when his story was still in its very starting point in Yarmouk, when he was still hesitating between, should I leave? or should I stay? Eventually he made the decision to stay and we stayed in touch with him uh, uh, over the phone, on WhatsApp, on various types of social media, via emails and so forth throughout the entire journey. At times we lose in touch with him for weeks. That's when he was imprisoned in Turkey. He was imprisoned in Turkey more than once uh, because every time the Greek uh, um, uh, Navy would catch him along with other Palestinians trying to escape through the sea and they would deliver them back to the, um, to the Turkish authorities. They would be thrown in jail and then they kept trying and trying until they managed to make it all the way to Europe. Uh, Khaled did not want to escape. Uh, in fact, in the beginning, he made the argument that when my grandfather left Palestine, um, the promise he made to himself that his family can only migrate in one direction, and that is leaving Damascus, leaving the refugee camp of Yarmouk, and heading back home. Um, in fact, this is why the book is called The Last Earth, because each one of these refugees was seeking a salvation in this permanent and final resting place, and that is their last earth. And it was kind of a play on words uh, uh, based on the poem, The Last Sky by Mahmoud Darwish. Um, so they were trying to find that peaceful place in which they can be themselves. They can be full citizens. They can be human beings with, with human rights that are respected and honored, as opposed to being in this permanent status of the refugee, living in the transitions between countries and 
political regimes and historical dates and so forth. Unfortunately, for, for Khaled, things did not work out very well. Uh, the scene in Yarmouk was getting complicated. And the complication was a result of the fact that uh, Yarmouk itself kind of fell right in the, in the firing line between the Syrian government and its various opposition parties, and eventually when ISIS got involved in Yarmouk and so forth. Many of these young Palestinians, especially, uh, if not really most of them kind of, you know, well-educated, uh, come from liberal, progressive political backgrounds, found themselves having to deal with um, a situation that was quite extreme in, in every possible way. Like for example, um, one of the people I spoke with um, was known as the pianist of the refugee camp. He would take his piano and he would usually would, would be seen in the center of the refugee camp playing music to little children. He was a music teacher. When ISIS took over the camp, I spoke to him while he was in hiding. They were trying to capture him because they believed that the fact that he was playing music uh, uh, was forbidden and needed to be stopped. And they destroyed and they set his piano on fire in, in, in an, in an uh, awesome spectacle of, of flames. Uh, and and uh, he went into hiding himself and we were talking while, we was, while he was still in hiding, uh, telling me that he had reached the conclusion that he needed to escape and he did. Khaled's story is not very different from that. He was involved in a hospital, in a morgue in particular. He doesn't have medical background. Most of his work was largely dealing with trying to keep the electricity going in the hospital as much as possible. At times he would be digging graves for many of the people who have died in the Yarmouk and the adjacent area. Um, but he reached a similar conclusion that his life was, was in danger and he needed to escape. And the question is how and, and where do I get the money from? And how do I deal with the fact that my family cannot join me um, and so forth. So the, you have these moral dilemmas uh, of, of uh, Khaled who has to leave. And unlike his grandfather, at least in the case of his grandfather, his entire family came with him. But in Khaled's case, the family refused. The idea here was we have escaped once and twice before, and we would either die in Yarmouk or go back to Palestine, but there would be no more exile for us. Khaled made his decision to escape, and he did. So Khaled uh, had to make that very difficult decision to um, leave without his family. Um, I think it's important that we draw attention to, you know, what escaping uh, look like for people like Khaled uh, getting to Europe. Um, what what was that path like? You know, it's it's not like you just bought a plane ticket and you know, flew somewhere in Europe, so. Of course, of course not. And, and Khaled's story in particular is really uh, a, a very pointed description of, of what these refugees have to go through, whether Palestinians, Syrians, Lebanese, or frankly, any other refugees who happen to be taking this, you know, this what I describe in the book as the Trail of Tears, uh, based on the uh, um, famous Native American uh, uh, story, uh, where, where even escaping Syria itself was quite a challenge because Yarmouk is, is somewhere in the center, center or the south of the country. So he needed to navigate his way uh, all the way to Aleppo and from Aleppo to, uh, to cross the border in Turkey. That in itself was a massive challenge because the country was, you know, has fallen under various uh, uh, authorities at the time. You had the Syrian government and army controlling uh, parts of the country. You had the opposition controlling other parts of the country, but also in the North, you have the various Kurdish militias controlling other parts of the countries. The trickery that they had to use, of course, you had the, 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 the smuggling at night and, you know, hiding in, in cars and pretending to speak of certain accents and, and then claiming that they support one side over the other and so forth and so on. Once they navigated their way out of Syria, they needed to cross 
uh, the border uh, uh, through Turkey. At that time, the Syria-Turkey border was quite porous and, and, and open. So that for them, that wasn't as much of a, of, the, of a challenge. Once they got to Turkey, the question was, how do we escape and where do we escape? Uh, at that time, the, the, the biggest escape route was through the sea from Turkey to Greece. Now, now they needed to find a person who would help them achieve that task. And many people at the time, many human smugglers from various countries, some Africans, some Europeans, some Middle Easterns, they will be found at various cafe shops and various gathering places, kind of basically, you know, just doing business, making promises, uh, saying that their boats are the best boats available and so forth and so on. And, and, and at the time, uh, Khaled uh, was with Maysoon, his partner at the time, and that is a whole different part of the story, uh, their camaraderie and then their breakup at the end of the journey. And then they managed to basically invest most of the money they had and they had uh, the, uh, my sons' uh, auntie send more money in order for them to cross and to cross the sea. And, and they thought they really did figure things out. Um, I think it was about three different attempts to even leave the harbor. At times the engine wouldn't work. At times they were arrested before they even took off. Another time the engine worked until a certain distance and they had to swim back to the shore. And eventually they did manage to move forward and, and somewhere in the middle of the area between in the Mediterranean, between Turkey and Greece, the, um, the Greek Navy managed to intercept their little boat that ran out of gas at the time, arrested all of them uh, and uh, sent them back to Turkey. The challenge for the Greek Navy, of course, was if you keep the refugees out before they enter the Greek territorial waters, uh, it's no longer, or it is not from a legal standpoint, from an international law standpoint, it's not Greek's responsibility to deal with them. So it, it, even if it means just basically pushing them slightly, pushing them a hundred feet back into the water and just letting them just drift uh, the sea until they are located by someone else or their boat sinks or they basically just starve to death. Um, and, and they were sent back, they were arrested, he spent days in prison, uh, came out again and tried again and again. And eventually he did cross and uh, he made it to, to uh, uh, the, the sand, to the beach. Uh, they were crying, they were hugging, they were, you know, uh, just jumping from joy and immediately they were caught by the Greek authorities and they were taken to a refugee uh, asylum camp. And then a whole phase of that uh, uh, arduous journey began. But now the politics gets even more complicated because it involves um, geopolitical realities that even within Khaled's limited knowledge of the world, he could not comprehend anymore. And he couldn't understand why would Serbia, Macedonia, uh, Greece and so forth become such an important players in his life. And, 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 and the, all the, 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 again, the trickeries and the deception he had to, um, to go through in order for him to cross. At one point he thought that there will be a, a shortcut. He pretended to um, uh, be uh, some, uh, a Portuguese, he pretended to be a Romanian, and every single yeah, and he time went, went through the security tried multiple with multiple passports right he, to he tried, security exactly to get yeah. through the security and at one point his face you know getting caught every time became so familiar that he didn't bother with that anymore so he decided to go the long route uh to whatever his destination was meant to be yeah and uh you know, I, I think everybody should read read your book to get the full story um, because it, it really is such a long and, and arduous journey. Um, I'd like to ask you, Dr. Ramsey, um, being a, a Palestinian refugee yourself, uh, what, what is it that 
um, is, is something that just is not, uh, talked about or understood, um, about the, the plight of, uh, a Palestinian refugee. Well, the, the idea that usually is conveyed when we discuss refugees, if the issue of Palestinian refugees is ever brought up or, or ever relevant from a, a, a news media perspective, um, is that, um, that the issue of Palestinian refugees is very complicated because a return of the millions of Palestinian refugees back to historic Palestine, today's Israel, is going to infringe on the identity of Israel, which identifies itself as a Jewish state. And if you infringe on that identity, then you are practically saying that Israel doesn't have the right to exist as a Jewish state. And Zach, I have been reminded of that really more times than I can possibly recount in numerous platforms and universities, <clears throat> giving talks here and there, where someone would stand and, and yell in response to me saying, my family has the right to return to Palestine as enshrined in international law. The right of return for Palestinian, Palestinian refugees should be respected, should be honored, again, according to international law. And yet somehow that is, is, is interpreted quite often as me advocating the dismantling of, of, of Israel because, because of the, the way Israel has chosen to define itself. In other words, our existence and our suffering and our diaspora as Palestinian refugees is now a very sensitive uh, subject for Israel. In fact, we are, as a Palestinian people, from Israeli Zionist point of view, an existential threat. We are quite often referred to as a demographic bomb. The fact that we are supposedly multiplying at a higher rate than Israelis make us a danger to the demographic uh, makeup of Israel and so forth. So I grew up in a refugee camp, kind of, you know, quite familiar with this idea. We had to be contained. Uh, if we leave, we were not allowed to come back uh, to keep the numbers at check. Our numbers is a threat, our existence is a threat and so forth. But the fact is in 1947-48, Israel could have not possibly existed without destroying hundreds of Palestinian towns and villages and the ethnic cleansing of the vast majority of the inhabitants of Palestine. Over two thirds of the Palestinian people at the time were expelled or forced to flee under the threat of massacres and gunfire. And my family was one of them. Currently, uh, you have 2 million people living in the Gaza Strip, this besieged, impoverished, a war-torn place. The vast majority of those two millions are the descendants of the original 200,000 Palestinians who were made refugees in 1948. The West Bank has its own refugee camps. South Lebanon uh, um, has uh, nearly 300, 400,000 Palestinian refugees. Syria before the war had its own massive uh, uh, communities of Palestinian refugees as, as uh, uh, is Jordan, Iraq, uh, and of course, I don't think there is a country anywhere in the world in which you don't have Palestinian refugees. Now, the question is, how can you still be a refugee 70 years after the fact? You know, we are not the first, nor will be the last refugee community. The reason that the issue of Palestinian refugees is quite complex is because the, the original sin the original problem, the crisis, the tragedy that led to that refugee crisis in the first place over 70 years ago has never really ceased. So the status, our status is still un uh, under international law is that of refugees and it hasn't been resolved. There has been no political solution to this issue whatsoever. So as a result, the Palestinian refugees of, of Lebanon are still living on all travel documents, well, I mean, we call it travel documents, they're not allowed to go anywhere, but they still hold old ideas that still defines them as refugees. When I left Gaza in 1994, I had what they call a laissez passe, an Israeli document that defined me, where it said nationality, the line was undefined. I wasn't a Palestinian, of course, I'm not an Israeli, 
I'm not an Egyptian or a Jordanian. Who am I then? Um, you can't even imagine, Zach, how, how amusing some of the various border polices that I encountered as I was leaving, leaving Palestine. They were just musing at this idea. What does it mean that you are undefined? And I would say, well, I'm a Palestinian. And they would say, well, we don't care. It says undefined. What does that mean? So you have millions of Palestinians who are more or less living on this undefined uh, uh, category. And we are still dealing with that issue. And this is why Marco became Marco. This is why Khaled and Nobani, the hero of our story, had to go through what he, what he had to go through. If he had a normal passport, like any other uh, person anywhere in the world, he would have been able to navigate. Yes, not all countries allow anyone coming from anywhere to enter fine, but he at least would have weighed his options. He would have realized that some countries would accept his passports and others wouldn't, but he had zero options. And as a result, he chose to smuggle himself, uh, going through sewage rivers in Macedonia, going through, uh, uh, um, you know, hiding on top of train uh, uh, trains and going through the back of taxis and so forth and so on, because people saw him as undefined. He is a nobody as far as travel documents are concerned. And this is really the search of identity and status, needless to say, political solutions, that millions of Palestinian refugees are still just sitting there waiting for it to happen. Dr. Ramsey, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, everybody, uh, check out Ramsey's writing and definitely pick up The Last Earth. Uh, thank you so much. Hope we can do it again sometime. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks for taking the time. What's up, everybody? Zach Boschman here, co-owner of Citizen Truth. The intro and outro songs are Brighton Ave by Audio Binger, and they are provided via the Creative Commons license. Please check us out at citizentruth.org. Thank you.